Well, good evening, everybody. Glad you all made it back. It's never fun to preach to an empty church. I don't know if you've tried it or not before, but um, I just want to say, just it's been awesome to be here, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to preach. Uh, something I don't take lightly. Um, just pray for Pastor Rossiter. He's preaching at Westgate, I believe, tonight. And uh, so I'd just like to invite you to turn to the book of James. That's the passage we're going to be considering tonight, the book of James in chapter 1. And a couple of announcements I want to just add really quickly that I forgot to tell uh, David before he came up here. Um, August 10th, I'd like to invite all the teens after we're done with visitation. We're going to have a teen activity that afternoon around 3 o'clock, so you guys should come. We're having a cook-off, a challenge between, we'll break it up into groups and it'll be a lot of fun, and so we'll have some more announcements for you next week, I believe, but right now, just mark it in your calendar, August 10th, after the visitation efforts, we're going to have a cook-off, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and so I really, I really encourage you to come if you get the chance to. And then also tonight, it would be a big blessing if I could just get some guys to help me after the service. We're going to clear off this stage and we're going to remove those chairs over there in preparation for the play tomorrow night. So if I could just have some guys stick around and just help get set up, that would be a, a big blessing. And so I appreciate that. So the book of James, we're going to be reading the first four verses. And what we're going to talk about tonight is, is a believer's response to trials. A believer's response when faced with difficulty. So the first four verses, uh, beginning in chapter 1. Verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for... The opportunity to preach tonight, I just thank you for your word, and that it's a help to us as we go through life, and I just pray this message would be a blessing, uh, be with Brother Rossiter as he preaches tonight, and uh, Lord, and I just pray that uh, you'd be pleased tonight, Lord, and we could just be blessed and give us safety on our way home. In your son's holy name I pray, amen. James, uh, so I'm going through the book of James here with the teams, I have the opportunity to preach this morning and then the next morning, next Sunday to the teens. And so I've never preached a series before. I've never gone through a book. And so I just really thought it'd be an awesome idea to go through the book of James. And so we went over the first four verses this morning. And God willing, next week we're going to do the next, I believe it's the next five. And there's just, there's a lot of practical lessons we can learn from James. James, he was writing to an audience that were experiencing just difficult times. If you read in the book of Acts, in chapter 8 specifically, uh, you'll read about Saul. You guys know about the, the man Saul, who he would persecute Christians. Christianity was relatively new to that world. And, and there was these, all these believers, these former Jews and, and even Gentiles alike, that had made a decision to follow Christ. And shortly after his ascension and, and the church was established, James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the, the leader there at Jerusalem. He was writing a letter, which is this book, to be a help to those believers living, as he says in verse 1, scattered abroad. So you just imagine the people, imagine them no longer being at their homes. They're scattered all throughout um, uh, uh, Judah, all, th or Judah, all throughout Jerusalem, Palestine. They were all different places, living in a different culture, being away from their families, uh, experiencing a lot of persecution, a lot of difficulty for their decision that they made to follow Christ. It wasn't an easy time. And the, the, the date of this letter, when it was written, uh, 45, 47 A.D., between that time, there was also a famine going on in the land. There's another uh, a difficulty that these people would be going through. You can read about that in Acts chapter 15. So James, he's writing a letter to address these believers, going through difficulty, going through hard time, and it's just a practical way to live, how believers are to live when faced with opposition. And you'll see, you can even see later on in the book of James, he addresses, uh, I believe it's in verse, uh, let me make sure here, verse um, uh, 9. He talks about, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. And verse 10 it says, but the rich that he is made low. So there, he's even addressing, uh, there were some of those believers that were losing their possessions, they were losing their houses and that would be because of the economical crisis there and also because of the persecution. So they were going through difficult times. So James, he writes this letter. And if I was going to write a letter of encouragement 
you know, or if I was going to write to believers who I knew were, were struggling, I probably wouldn't start off the way that he did. I'd probably try to, you know, console or something. But that's not, James gets straight to the point. How believers, how Christians, how we're supposed to respond when faced with difficulty. So I just want to make sure that, that this letter applies to us today. Could, could we all agree that we go through hard times? Amen. We all go through struggles? And we all go through, I praise the Lord, we live in the U.S. and we don't have to, to deal with uh, uh, certain situations like they do in, in Sri Lanka or, or Pakistan where they are persecuted for their faith. And, and we don't have to deal with like what the, the, the first century believers had to deal with, losing possessions and not being able to be, take care of ourselves. We don't deal with things like that. Praise the Lord. But we do go through hardships in life, do we not? Divorce is not an easy thing. Losing, losing loved ones is never easy. You know, it, it can even be a frustrating process when you're, you're working and you're trying to be a faithful witness and your coworkers or maybe your boss, they, they do everything in their power to, to poke you, to prod you because you're a Christian. And I think we all could agree that Christianity as a whole is definitely under attack. <coughs> so yes, we absolutely go through difficult times. So we can place ourselves as the audience of what James is going to communicate in this passage here. Going through hard times. So what's his response? What does he, what does he say? Uh, beginning in verse 2. He says this. Count it all joy, my brethren. So he's addressing all those who have placed their faith in Christ and like him as a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, this is what he, his command is to them. To count it all joy. So basically, the idea there to count it joy is, is to look at your situation to look at the difficulty that you're going through and to determine that you're going to maintain an attitude of joy. That you're going to respond to your difficult situation to, in a joyful manner. It, what, what James is not saying is, is the fake happiness, right? He's not saying that you have to, uh, you, know, you just get in a car accident and you lose your car and you have to walk around like all smiles and happy about it. That's, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying be disingenuous. But he's saying you have the choice when you're faced with a difficulty that you can choose to respond to it in a joyful manner. Because when you respond to a, a crisis or to a situation that's not easy, you're expressing your faith in God. Joy in the face of adversity is the expression of faith. As you think about it, how, how else could, what reasons do we have to be happy when, or, or joyful when we're going through a difficult situation? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. He gave us, he gave, God sent His Son. He's given us plenty of reason uh, uh, of to, to be joyful. So he's saying, you maintain an attitude of joy. And James, he, he had to, there's some intentional effort there. You have to count it. You have to make the decision. And why would he have to say to count it all joy? Because, like I said, when we're faced with temptation, our, our tendency is to count it as frustration, Right? When we're faced with a, a, a financial situation, you're living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, you're wondering how you're making ends meet, you don't really seem to be uh, progressing in life or, or making money or it just, you seem to be stuck. Our, our tendency is to respond or to count at what? Frustration? Anger? When we're faced with difficult situations, it's not natural to, to count it as joy. In fact, we, we would rather, our, our, it's natural to, to count it as despair or as sorrow, or as hopelessness. But James is saying, to, to do that which is counterintuitive, and to count it joy. To look at your situation, and to choose to place your faith and trust in a sovereign God who knows the end of your trial before you ever even begin it. Amen. Who's always there. He knows the answer. He knows exactly what you're going to go through. And I like the wording that he uses. He says this, Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Notice the word when, right? It's always coming. I mean, I don't want to be discouraging tonight. This is, this is what the Bible says. This is what James is saying here. I'm not trying to be doom and gloom or anything like that, but the fact is it's a when. It's a matter of when. Because we're all going to go through struggles. We're all going to go through temptations, things that would, that would test us, that are not easy. And so James is saying when ye fall into diverse temptations. And also the word fall has the idea of you can imagine, it's not like, it's not like you kind of just mosey on into a trial, right? They normally, all of a sudden, they happen. Like, you don't wake up in the morning and decide, you know, today's a good day to get in a car accident. No. That just kind of happens, right? We don't expect it. 
And normally when we go through temptations and we go through trials, we don't, we don't see them coming. The, the Jews of that time, the Christians that were experiencing the persecution from men like Saul, that sure, they, they lived probably cautiously, but they never knew when someone was going to come through the door and take them away and imprison them. They didn't expect it. The idea, the picture that he's trying to portray is you're falling. Like all of a sudden, boom, you fall in a hole. You're surrounded by it. I can remember this one time, me and my friend, we were uh, four-wheeling, it's a blast, we were racing, everything was going great. All of a sudden, he like makes a hard veer to the right. I don't know what he was doing. And I kind of look at him, I was like, what's he doing? And I noticed there's this drop-off right in front of me that he knew about, but I didn't. Some friend, right? <laughs> Anyways, so he kind of goes around, and I'm just driving, and next thing I know, I'm just like flying through the air, and it was kind of a glorious scene, like my hair is blowing, I, I don't have long hair, but I was flying through the air, and I'm telling you, all of a sudden, I was just gripped, fear, uncertainty, life flashes before my eyes, like what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, hit the bottom, it wasn't that bad, I survived. But that's kind of how, that's kind of how trials hit us though, right? All of a sudden, you're in it. All of a sudden, you're faced with an ailment that you did not expect. All of a sudden you lost that loved one. All of a sudden, you, you're, you're the job, you lose your job. You know, you never know. It, it, it just falls into it. And so James is he's also telling us here, by counting it all joy, by making the intent, the intentional effort to view temptations as an opportunity to trust the Lord, you're also preparing yourself. Because one of the hardest things about going through trials is you're not prepared for it. It just comes, just happens. And you're just in it. And so James is, and by, by deciding to count it all joy, to view this as an opportunity, this, this, what would naturally call for disappointment or fear or uncertainty, to choose to, to maintain an attitude of joy, he's saying that's another way that you can prepare for, the, for trials that are inevitably going to come. Because they'll come to all of us. I like what one Bible commentator said. He said, trials are not electives in God's school, but rather requires courses, right? It's, it's part of a growing process. And so, <clears throat> he's telling us to count it all joy when those temptations come. And just to, just to be clear, I, he uses the word temptation, not necessarily a trial, but a temptation. And so just to, to explain that a little bit, to clarify on it, a temptation would be anything that would tempt us, right, to respond negatively towards God or towards others. It could be, it could be something as simple as, as, a, as a, a frustrating spouse, right? <laughs> I, don't, I can't speak, I have no uh, authority there yet, I'm not married. But, but I know what it's like to have a friend or have someone you care about and they just, they can rub you the wrong way sometimes. It, or even siblings. It could be your siblings. It could be a, a position at work. It could be you don't agree with your boss. You don't like the way that he runs the company. You don't like the way that he does it, exercises leadership. It seems inefficient. You know, there's, there's several ways, there's several scenarios that we find ourselves in on a daily basis that could easily cause us to respond with our attitude in a way that's displeasing to God or even to others. That would, that would demonstrate to others who would be watching us that we're not, we're, not a, we don't, we're not a Christian. We're not following Christ. We're not trying to please Christ with our lives. That would be the alternate response, is responding to a trial in a way that, that, would, that would not be characteristic of what a Christ follower should be. And so James is saying, count it all joy when you fall into adverse temptations. And he, there's a reason. God uses temptations. And, the believer, and he's telling these believers that are, are, that are living in difficult times, and he's telling even us today, that we should respond to temptations with joy because, here's the reason why, because God uses the temptations, God uses the difficult times in our life to bring us into a deeper and a stronger relationship with Him. The first, in verse 2 you'll notice it says this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He uses temptations to test us. He uses temptations to show us what kind of faith we have. You know, I like Jim Berg's illustration in the book, uh, Changing It to His Image, and he uses it a little bit differently, but it applies here, is that what our, what our faith in God is like, what our relationship with Christ is like, you can compare it to like a tea bag, right? 
And then hot water would be the difficult situations that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not until we're placed in that hot water that what we really are, our relationship with Christ, the, the depth of our relationship with Christ really shows itself, right? right? Temptations, trials, that's a really good place to put our faith in the spotlight to see what we're, what we're made of. And so in verse 2 it says, knowing this, the trying of your faith. It's during the times of temptations and when you choose to trust God, you choose to view His sovereignty instead of your circumstance, that He grows you. I think of men like, um, like Paul the Apostle. What an excellent example, right? He said, whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. But notice in the verse he says, for I have learned whatsoever state to be content. It's a process. You don't just all of a sudden have patience. You don't just all of a sudden have the ability to say, okay, God, I'm going through this struggle. It's hard, but uh, I'm going through it and I'm going to trust you. No, that, that comes through a process, a training process. Patience, the word it's used there, it, it's a Greek word. I'm going to look at it, otherwise I'm going to butcher it pretty badly. Uh, the Greek word for patience here is, uh, you know what? There it is, hupomon. And it's not describing a, a, a passive Patience, like you're just sitting there waiting. God's not teaching you to just sit there and wait it out. No, it's talking about an active patience, an endurance, being able to continue even though the, dip, even though this, this, the circumstance is difficult. Look at the life of Paul. He needed that kind of patience to continue doing the work that God called him to do because he faced all sorts of persecution. I mean, he was, he was stoned, he was beaten. And, and through temptations, through a process of time, of Paul choosing to trust in God's sovereignty and not view his circumstance and let it get the better of him, God trained him. God brought him to a place, taught him patience that he, that he could use to endure further trials. And we need that as we go through our Christian life. Because like I said before, we're always going to face difficulties. Being a Christian, li just living life in general is hard. And then being a Christian, there's another layer to it. And so we need that, that patience that, that only God can teach us, that that ability to trust Him and to continue living in a way that pleases Him even though the circumstances are difficult, even though the circumstances are hard. And so James is saying, hey guys, respond to trials with joy because God uses trials, God uses persecutions to teach you patience. That's one side of it. Now notice verse number uh, 3. Knowing this, the uh, trying of your faith worketh patience. I'm sorry, verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work. See, we have, like I said before, it's a process. God brings us through temptations. He puts our faith on trial. He shows us areas that we're lacking. And then if we choose to respond in the right way, God grows us. God teaches us patience. But He also, notice the word perfect and entire. He uses it to bring us into a more Christ-like. Um, he, he, he uses it to bring us to become more Christ-like. Because isn't that the goal of Christianity? We're, we're living and we're doing our best to follow the, the example that Jesus Christ left us. That's sanctification. That's, that's choosing to become more like Christ. And if you notice our example, Christ, when He was on earth, man, He experienced everything, right? He experienced mo uh, mockery, ridicule. He was, he was crucified. He was beaten. And the whole time, knowing that was going to happen, He, he never once complained to, cry, uh, about, to God. He never complained about His ministry, what He was doing on earth. The whole time He stayed submitted to God. And He's our example. And so what James is saying here is that as, as patience is being produced in our life, it will also bring us to, to perfect us. To, uh, let me get the wording right. I thought I had this memorized, but I didn't. Just kidding. Sorry. That ye may be perfect and entire. He's not saying that you will be a perfect, flawless Christian, but a perfected Christian, a more mature Christian. Because a mature Christian is one who, who is able to look at circumstances, looking at difficulties in life, and know that God is in control, and choose to trust Him and respond in joy instead of what would be natural. And so God uses temptations to bring us and to a more Christ-like relationship. He, he used it to mature us, to grow us. It's always, it's always amazing to me to see, like, uh, going to Heartland, you know, I get to meet a lot of church planners, a lot of missionaries, 
And there's a lot that have experienced real, um, some challenges that, you know, praise the Lord, we'll never have to. And it's always an amazing thing to see them and to see the kind of, of um, contentment that they have. Like, they're, they're consistent. They always praise the Lord. They never talk about how difficult life on the mission field is like. And it's because through the process of time, God has brought them into a deeper, more mature Christianity. So God uses temptations. He uses that in our life. You think about, I think about the Israelites, right? Here's a good example. They, God had just done an amazing thing. He, he, he showed His power in Egypt. He sent all of the plagues. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt, proving to them that how powerful He was and that He was on their side. He led them by the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, brought them to the Red Sea, and as soon as the Egyptians started coming, what did they do? They were panicking. They said, here come the Egyptians. They complained to Moses. They said, hey, why did you bring us out here just so we can die? We should have just stayed in Egypt. They totally manifested an untrusting relationship to God, even though they just witnessed the power of God. And you'll notice, after the Red Sea, God delivered them, brought them to the Red Sea, and as soon as they were confronted with another problem, they needed water, what did they do? They complained. They missed it. There was an opportunity for them, that's an example, to grow, to see God work, to trust Him, and to become more mature next time they encountered a temptation to trust Him. But they, they did not. And you'll see that's the same pattern they followed all the way through the wilderness. And we have that tendency too. We can see God do amazing things in our life. And we, He can bring us through difficulties. And then as soon as we're faced with another challenge or another trial, we're like, God, why? And we try to take matters into our own hands. We try to, try to figure things out for ourselves instead of just trusting Him. Or we let it affect our attitude in a negative way. So God uses, notice, notice the word, He says, but let patience. So you have to allow it, right? You can interrupt, you can interrupt the process. If you're, if, you're, if you're, instead of manifesting an attitude of joy or responding to the temptations in a trusting manner, trusting that God will bring you through it and that God will help you through it, you're interrupting that growing process that God wants to... He, you're interrupting God from bringing you to that more mature, perfected Christian that He wants you to be. So James is saying, hey guys... Respond to temptations in joy. Because God uses temptations first to teach you patience. To produce in you a godly patience that will help you in life. That will help you please God. But also because He uses temptations to mature you. To perfect you. To bring you into a closer resemblance to His Son. Who ultimately uh, pleased Him. One more thing. And last tonight. It says this. That ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There's another thing that we can learn through temptations that God uses in our life for temptations. And that is this, contentment. You know, it, it, you think of Paul the Apostle. You know, sitting in the prison cell and circumstance wasn't great. But him and Silas, you know, they were able to sing. They were able to manifest the joy of the Lord and you ask yourself, like, how is that possible? How is it possible for, for someone like H.G. Wells, or no, that's not right, oops, H.G. Spafford, that's what I meant. <laughs> Two very different people, right? <laughs> Spafford, the writer of It Is Well With My Soul. I mean, if you know the story, the backstory to that author, you know, he experienced just tragedy after tragedy. He lost his business, he lost his son, he lost his four daughters. And when he went over the ocean, the spot where his daughters sank, he was able to pin the words, it is well with my soul. I think of like uh, uh, Miss El you know the story of Jim Elliot, where he was called to these particular Indians and, and they killed him. And then later on, his wife went and was able to witness and be able to bring a lot of them to the Lord. And, and to be able to respond that way instead of in an angry or bitter, or how, you, know, you ask yourself, how is that possible? It's because through the process of time, God taught her, taught that family, contentment. How to be content in His plan and His sovereignty, even though the, the circumstance where they were at right then wasn't easy. wasn't easy at all. God uses Amen. temptations to teach us contentment. How to rest in Him. In Isaiah, um, Isaiah 40, 31, it says this, But they 
that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I like the, the how many of you have read, I'm just going to do a show of hands here. How many of you have you read the, uh, the story of Habakkuk, the minor prophet Habakkuk? It's like three chapters long. I love that story. It's just three chapters long, and the whole thing is just a conversation between God and the prophet Habakkuk. And he struggled because God was, he, uh, he was looking out at the people that he was called to minister to, and they were living ungodly. They were backslidden. And he asked God, why aren't you going to do something? Do you see your people the way that they're living? And God responded to him. And that's a blessing, right? Because God doesn't always show us his plan. But he showed Habakkuk his plan. He said, Habakkuk, I see the condition of my people. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to judge them. I'm going to bring Babylonians to judge them. And Habakkuk, he struggled with that too. He's like, how could you bring a wicked nation like the Babylonians to be your instrument of justice? That just doesn't seem right. But by the end of it, God had taught Habakkuk that even though the circumstance wasn't easy, even though his people were inevitably going to be judged and Habakkuk was going to witness it, that he was in control. Because just like he was holding the Israelites to his justice, he was holding the Babylonians to his justice. And ultimately, he was in control. And by the end of it, Habakkuk the prophet, he was able to sing and praise the Lord and say that even though all this is going to happen, I trust the Lord. And that's the kind of contentment that God wants to produce in all of us. He wants to bring us all to a place where we trust Him, no matter what the difficulty is. But it, it's, it's, it's all through a process, and it's all through if we learn, with just a little temptation, just the little things in life, to respond to Him, to respond to the situation in a joyous way. Like I said, once, once again, not, not necessarily, um, you know, being insincere or, or making yourself be happy or something like that. It's not what he's saying. He's saying you have the choice. Because when you're faced with a temptation, you can either choose. I can either allow myself to, to succumb to the pressures of it. I can respond in bitterness. I can respond in anger. I can respond in fear. I can, I can show a lack of trust in God. Or I can choose to have joy knowing that God is in control and that God is so sovereign and that God will bring me through it and that God has a reason. So, believers, the believers that James is writing to, and even those of us in here tonight, the members here at Cornerstone, all of us, we should respond to temptations with joy because it, it's through temptations that God teaches us patience. He brings us into a maturity, uh, a greater maturity, and He also teaches us contentment, how to be content with where we're at. So we should be grateful that God is working on us through hard times, through difficult times. So, man, we are early. When I, when, I, when I practiced this, it was like 35, 40 minutes, so I cut a bunch of stuff out. I don't know how that happens. But in conclusion, I'm sure you guys don't mind. Fellowship time, right? In conclusion, I would challenge you to think this way. You know, a good way to gauge like where, where you're at when it comes to temptations is what's the first thing you do? What's your first response? What's your first reaction? Do you, do you panic? You know, when you're... When you're uh, you know, dealing with a, 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 maybe a, a financial crisis or, or a financial situation. What's your response? Do you trust the Lord? Do you, ask him, do you go to Him first and ask Him for your help, His help? Or is it automatically, you know, what am I going to do? What do I have to do to solve this problem? You know, a, a good example of this is, uh, so I went to Heartland Baptist Bible College and, and a problem that you see just universally, everybody goes through it, is trouble paying the school bill. That payment's always coming, you know, it's always there. You, you, you can try to hide it, but it's always there for some reason. And, uh, and it's a, sometimes it's a difficult balance because we're working a full-time job and, and even sometimes with that you don't have enough for the next payment. And I've seen student after student, including myself, just say, God, you brought me here to Heartland. This is part of my ministry's training and I don't have enough for my school bill. What's the next step? Where am I going to get this money? Now, for me to take it upon myself, I could easily say, well, I'm going to get a second job and then neglect or even put off what God has called me to do at Heartland is to study. And is to, is to be involved and to learn ministry. I'm not saying the second job is a bad thing. That's not what I'm saying at all. But instead of, it, but if my response is to, to take it into my own hands, to take the situation in my own hands and try to figure it out myself without seeking the Lord, you're not manifesting uh, an attitude of trust in the Lord when you're, when you're facing that temptation. God wants us to trust in Him first. So what's your response when you're in a difficult situation? How do you react? Do you go to the Lord? Is it, is it automatic anger? Is it automatic frustration? 
You know, parenting, when, when, when the kids are, are not behaving in a way that, that pleases you or, or you've tried to work on them and it just doesn't seem to get it, it's not, not registering, are you responding to that in, in, in a trust, trusting God way, asking for His help, or are you responding in frustration? Now, there's various situations this applies to. And I, I, that's why I like the word he uses, diverse. He says, count all joy when you fall into diverse, t diverse temptations, because that's a variety from the, the most extreme to even down this to simplistic. Any situation that would cause you to respond in a negative way. And he's saying to count it joy. To respond with your attitude, with who you go to first, not yourself but the Lord. Respond with joy. So I, I just, in conclusion, just think about this. What is, what is your natural response? How do you, do you consider it an opportunity? Do you consider it an opportunity to grow? Or is your first response, how do I, how do I handle this? So if I could get uh, a piano player to come up here, Isabella, thank you. We'll just have a time.